So really quick before the video starts, I have a couple of things that I need to announce. The first of which being that we hit the follower goal of 250 followers over on my Twitch. Which means that at some point very soon, I'm going to have to do a Treasure Island marathon. This will include the main three official games, which are the remake of the original Five Nights at Treasure Island, Doubletus Casa, and the new Nightmares Below Disney. This won't be a 100% thing, but it's going to be getting at least through the main game. So, the first five nights. But it will mean that I'll be doing some practice before the main thing over on my Twitch, twitch.tv at 1am Wolfram. So, make sure not to miss that. As well as this, as of posting this video, if I post it on the right day. So, the video took a little bit longer to make than I thought. You have 28 days. Good luck. And since I will then be 18, I'll feel a lot more comfortable about showing my face. Which, like I promised quite a while ago, at least I think I did, I said that if we manage to hit some kind of big goal once I'm 18, then I'll do a face reveal, because I've been asked about it a couple of times now, and we're already extremely close to hitting 5k. So, as of right now, if we manage to hit 5k subscribers before my birthday, then I'll do a face reveal once it is my birthday. As well as this, I'll be releasing that small project that I talked about last video. With the way that things have been going recently, we've been growing faster and faster, and I just wanted to give you fans of the channel something as a thanks for your support. It really means the world to me that I'm able to make you guys at least a little bit happier with my content, but with all that said, let's get into the actual video. Ah, the Nintendo 64. A console that holds nostalgia to many. It came out back in 1996 and was widely recognized for its fancy new 3D graphics. It also spawned the likes of Super Mario 64, which has its own can of worms for things I want to talk about in the future, Majora's Mask, GoldenEye, and so many others. But Nintendo 64 was an outstanding console for its time, and it's one of the many reasons we have games like we do today. And I'm not just talking about the improvements in graphics over the years, I'm talking about nostalgic horror. Nostalgia is defined as a sentimental longing or wistful affection for a period in the past. Things like childhood memories are just generally happy memories from the past. It's why when I get a brain liquor from a corner shop, I feel like I'm seven years old again, running around my house like a conked out weasel. Seriously, I don't know what the fuck they put in that blue sugary liquid, but it makes me act like a rabid dog. It just kind of happens. But the concept of nostalgic horror has been making the rise over the years. It's why you see a lot of horror, mainly creepypastas, taking something from your childhood and twisting it into something so horribly demented it makes you wish you never experienced it. Things like Mario rom hacks, Ben Drowned, Slendy Tubbies, things from your childhood that are now not as pleasant as you remember them being. But why am I explaining this all to you? Well, today I'm going to tell you guys about a game which, to be completely honest with you, is the first game in a long time to genuinely make me fearful whilst playing it. And I'm not just talking about getting jumpy or spooked from a quick scare, I mean just standing in the environment, being in the menus, just walking around made me feel like I had a reason to be afraid. And the game I'm talking about is Shipwreck 64, but obviously you knew that from the title in the thumbnail. Shipwreck 64 originally came out on July 16th, 2022, and on its own, the game was pretty spooky. You play as Bucky the Beaver, who had crashed his boat, which he and his friends, Olive the Otter, Giovanni the Goose, and Walter the Walrus, who was on his own boat and also just happened to crash on the same island, were also aboard. Turns out that they'd all been kidnapped by the island's inhabitants, the Wolves, and were being forced to do basic labor for crashing into their island and seemingly disturbing the peace. The story behind the game's existence is that Cogwar Games, an in-universe game-making company, originally partnered up with another animation company called Broadside Animation back in 1997 to make a game based around Bucky and the gang. And as we'll come to find out, some horrible events occurred and the game was a flop after being soft-launched, and the game kind of just faded into obscurity until now, where an in-universe squeaks to Corge, who is also the creator of the game out of universe, with the help of some other really talented individuals, decides to create their own emulator for the game since it wouldn't work on any others, and releases it to the public stating that This game contains some disturbing artifacts and glitches. It is not for the faint of heart. And we are then put into a small intro sequence.
didn't go for the game like normal, saving Bucky's friends with various tasks being completed, meeting a couple of the wolves along the way, and meeting one of my personal favorite characters, Horns. But after saving everyone, we go back to our now repaired boat, and I haven't mentioned it yet, but this game has an absolutely fucking banger theme to it. <laughs> This is of course the regular ending. The real fun starts when we decide to start doing shit we're not meant to be doing. When we begin to purposely lose the minigames over and over, we get some pretty spooky scenes and a lot of horror elements of the game come through. After going through these sections, some more areas unlock, and most of them happen again in the remake anyway, so I won't be going over them, but <laughs> in one of them, Bucky absolutely beats the living shit out of someone with a chair, so that's pretty funny. We also find out that this obviously isn't Bucky the character, it's another person wearing the mascot suit of Bucky, but we'll find out more on that later on. And then going back to the boat after failing all the minigames, it gives us this ending. And then going around the island, we can find these wooden puppets, also known as husks, and after collecting the last ones, we instead get this final ending. Do you really think we can extend our generosity to you for that much longer to create this, I don't know, I don't know what, do you, what do you call it, a game? I can't even tell. I'm saying we're done. We're not putting up with this project anymore. Unless you can pitch something to us that is the technical marvel you describe, I don't want to see it. We cannot keep sinking money Get into this. Out. Get the fuck out! Alright. I can see I'm not wanted here.
Obviously, I'm skipping out on a lot of the details, but there's no point in me explaining stuff that we're going to be going over anyway. A lot of the stuff in this game is just ported over from the old one into the remake, or it's changed for the lore, so... There's no point in me explaining stuff, this is just to show that what the original game was like. But after releasing this first version of Shipwreck 64, Squeaks decided to give the game a bit of a revamp and remade most of the game. Keeping a lot of the same story and some of the old scenes from the original, but adding new characters, new areas, and most of all, new scares. And this is the version that I'm going to be going more in depth about today. And seeing as this has only been the intro and we're already into the video, I can already tell you that this is going to be a long one, to say the fucking least. So make sure you get some snacks, get comfy, and get ready for a very long discussion about this absolutely genius game, Shipwreck 64, the updated 2024 version. Wait, wait, hold on a fucking minute, what do you mean, what's a lair? Well, as you know by now, the game isn't how it really seems, and because of that we have layers 1 to 4, one being the most normal and the most tame, and 4 being the final layer of the game, and it's where we're going to be trying to get to throughout the whole game. But starting off in our first layer, we can start the game by doing a- oh wait, actually, I gotta go- I gotta go be right back, can you guys watch the game for me whilst I'm gone? Yes, that is right. Even before we start the game, we can see very clearly that something isn't right with this game. And we'll come back to why this man is important later on, but for right now, we need to take ourselves over to the settings, where we can find an option for online play. But this isn't between you and other players, of course, no, no. This is specifically before between you and Squeaks the Corge himself. Yes, you heard me right, Squeaks the Corge, the creator of the game, can just join you at any point in time if you decide to leave this option on. And usually he'll just join to show players certain secrets whilst in the model of Stumbler, a character who we'll meet soon. And since Squeaks is actually the voice actor for Stumbler, he's able to turn on his mic and speak to the player in Stumbler's voice. Which I think is a really funny touch to the game. You're just in the middle of getting the absolute shit scared out of you and then the creator of the game can come to just tell you how much of a fucking dumbass you are. That is a entirely different type of horror. But coming into the new game door, we're able to see two options. One for the 2023 version of the game, which is the version those in-universe depths fixed up and patched together to make the game like it was supposed to have been, and another version which we are yet to unlock. And I gotta say that they nailed the old school console type of menu screen. Like I can imagine seeing this after loading up an old PlayStation 2 or something. But getting into the game, we're once again given a starting intro sequence. Hey, everyone! I need your help! Step into the 3 d realm with Bucky and his friends. Explore a vast open island, and hopefully, bring your friends back to safety. So, 
So what do you say, buddy? Let's go rescue the gang. We are then put into the game with the text of Day 1 hovering over the soon to be explored island. Oh, hi! Looks like my prayers have been answered. Listen, you gotta help me. I was out in the sea with my friends. And I crashed my boat, it was awful. My friends were all kidnapped. It was pretty bad, yeah. But you can help, right? Here, let me show you how it works. Also, I gotta say that Bucky has one hell of a fucking hand on him. Like, <laughs> that, that would put a fully grown adult into a coma. But beginning our journey around the island, which we find to be named Nulla Terra, which when translated into English stands for no land or nothing earth, which definitely has its implications, but getting back to the game, we're once again tasked with saving Bucky's friends, Olive Giovanni and Walter, with the additional tasks of going to help out Stumbler and fixing our boat by talking to Chief Wolf, who just so happened to have left us a note in what is called the Hull. It's a note about the hull. Hello and welcome to the Nolotera. You're in the hull now. I save space for new visitors. Make yourself comfy and take care. Chief Wolf. With this area, I can also introduce the concept of the day and night cycle. The day start at 1pm and end at midnight. During this time, we can go around completing tasks and saving our friends. But once it hits midnight, we must return to the hull and sleep until the next day, as all remaining characters will go off to bed. And getting a bit of a lay for the land, we can find our explorable areas to be the beach, the park, the living quarter, the town hall, and the theatre, as well as any other area that takes place during the minigames. We start off on the beach, and there isn't really much to find here, so we can go into the park and find Olive standing around waiting for us. Also, in these areas we can find secrets, and I won't be going over them purely just because after writing the script, the video is already as long as it is, and if you want to go and play the game for yourself, I heavily suggest doing so just to find all the secrets, but just know that they're lurking around every other couple of corners. But talking to Olive, she tells us that the wolves are forcing her to collect coconuts for them, and that she's horrible at finding stuff and asks us for our help in finding 30 coconuts. In the minigame itself, we must open chests and slap trees to find our coconuts, and upon completion, Olive thanks us and goes to wait for us at the beach. We can then go and visit Giovanni at the theatre, who informs us that he's been tasked with cooking for all the wolves, and that he's struggling with the amount of food he's been tasked with making because of his stupid bird hands, and then proceeds to call us a rodent before forcing us to cook for him. The ungrateful fucking bastard. In this minigame, we basically just have to run around in a big circle and interact with the ovens as they go off to prevent them from setting on fire, and doing so, we are given yet another super kind and friendly speech from Giovanni before he goes to join Olive at the beach. And we are then able to complete one more task for the day in the living quarters, that being Walter's task of helping him fix his boat. Also, I say fix his boat, but it's more of just get it out of the dock. 
it's, it's just kind of trapped in the dark. But all we have to do is complete a bit of parkour and make sure to stop whenever the lights turn off or else a mysterious entity will fish us up into the clouds or something. But after riding out on Walter's boat, he thanks us and joins the others on the beach. As do us as we return to the hall to sleep to move on to the next day. This time we have the options of going to the town hall and talking to either Stumbler or Chief Wolf. And speaking to Chief Wolf, he tells us that in order to fix our boat, we're gonna have to go into the woods and collect pieces of wood to build our boat with. And after arriving there, we are luckily gifted sudden x-ray vision as we're able to see all six pieces of wood that we need to collect as well as- Wait a minute, that one's moving. That's right, Horns is back again and he's actually pretty easy to avoid, I'm not even gonna lie to you. But keeping far away from Horns, we're able to collect our wood and bring it back to Chief Wolf, where we then only have one more task to complete. Going over to Stumbler, he informs us that because of his whole lack of arm situation, it makes it really hard for him to paint. However, he really wants to make a piece of art to impress another rabbit he has a crush on. So we are then tasked with going around collecting ink bottles for him and making sure to pick up his canvas if it falls over when we hear this audio cue. But after lasting the time limit, we're able to help Stumbler finish his piece and he goes to sit in the theater. And if we go to sleep and return the next day, we can find this new character has taken his place in the town hall. This is JD and he's come to ask us if we want to go into the volcano and save all of the wolves who would instead be left behind to die if we choose to leave now. And obviously it comes without question that even in this first version we have a multitude of different options that allow us to gain different endings depending on how many people we saved, as well as right now if we choose to accept JD's mission which has its own two different endings depending on whether or not you're able to actually complete the volcano parkour in time. The endings that I personally have been able to find are the true hero ending where you save everyone and complete the volcano mission, The bad ending where you either fail the volcano mission or you take too much time and nobody makes it off the island.
the regular ending where you leave in the boat without doing the volcano mission at all. And of course, the different options of leaving on the boat early, also known as the confused ending. Perfect! Oh, thank you, thank you. Let me hit the shore to begin. <laughs> However, this is of course only for the 2023 version, and while there is a lot of secrets here, there's not any kind of spook factor to it. This is the version that for the most part is how the game was intended to be, so there isn't much scary stuff to be found here. And that's why after completing the 2023 version at least once, you can gain access to the original 1997 version, which is where the true horror of this game begins to show itself. I just want to make a warning note now, which will be my one and only warning throughout this entire video, because this is about to delve into the really creepy and really lore-intensive part of the game, and I go over a lot of spoiler content from this point on. I delve further into the lore and what makes the game truly horrifying to me personally, and if you want to go and experience the game for yourself, which I heavily recommend, I say to do so now. The game is relatively cheap, and the quality is definitely worth your time. Moving into the 1997 version, I of course went to go and see if playing the game normally would result in anything different. And nothing bad's gonna happen. I <laughs> mean, you're not safe in general, yeah. Okay, we'll see what happens at the end of this, and then I'll probably end up stream there. <laughs> Be extra not safe. You're never safe, ever. Yeah, I think this is just the normal idea. Yeah, I know there's a whole like, there's like the layers and stuff like that, but we can go for that in another stream. To be honest, I'm kind of happy with having like a whole other stream dedicated to doing all the creepy stuff. You're doing it wrong. Do you think this is gonna get you anywhere? That's really, really funny. Get back in there. You have unfinished work. You think I'm gonna let you pick up the controller and get your pansy ass back in there? Do not listen to the instructions, stupid idiot. Try harder. <laughs> God. Do not listen to instructions, toodles. <laughs> so, so yeah, the game cussed me out and called me multiple forms of stupid for even considering playing the game normally was the correct way. So I'ma play it the incorrect way from now on. In this version of the game, we get a different intro sequence to start off with. Hey, everyone! I need your help!
So what do you say, buddy? Let's go rescue the gang! The green screens are visible and it looks unfinished, as to be expected with this being the earlier version. Getting into the game, Bucky says the same introductory speech before we are then allowed to once again go and explore the different areas. And we can start off by talking to Olive once more. This time we can continuously fail the minigame and can speed up our time by absolutely beating the shit out of Olive over and over again. After failing for the first time, Olive gives us a small sympathy speech, same as the 2023 version, However, after failing once more, we are sent to this small room, which includes a couple of beds, barrels, and a projector. The area has a sinister feeling to it, and just generally is the first main area where... things start to get fucking creepy. We know we're no longer supposed to be here, and it only gets darker from here. Playing the projector, we're shown a scene of a character named Olivia on the phone, complaining about a person wearing a Bucky the Beaver mascot costume staring at her from her front door. Hello, we are not available now. Please leave your name and phone number after the beep. We will return your call. He showed up at the door again. I, I don't know what to do. Something about him just, just felt wrong. <laughs> and I just want to point out a detail of this game that I love and adore. Throughout the game, we'll discover these separate versions of Bucky's friends, those being the IRL mascot costume-esque versions of them. And just taking a look at the designs of these creepier versions of the characters, I have to say that these have to be one of my favourite designs in mascot horror that I've ever seen. They have this dirty, gritty look to them as if they haven't been looked after in a long time, and it makes it even better when you realise that these aren't even really mascots. These are instead called starlings. What is a starling, you may ask? Well, remember that animation company I was talking about before, Broadside Productions? They wanted to best Disney and remember this guy from before? This is Rex Broadside, the founder of the company, and in order to attempt to best Disney after the death of Rex, the company began looking into ways to develop immortality in order to bring Rex back to life. Kind of like if you combined Disney with the Umbrella Corporation from Resident Evil. And after a few failed generations, we have what is now deemed as a success by the company, and is the main characters we'll see today. I'll talk about them more later, but all that you need to know is that due to the way that the Starlings are made, they have to remain in the mascot costumes in order pre to prevent them from being infected from the outside world, and that in order to get these newer generations, the company had to use their own employees. Specifically, they used their employees Olivia Finch, Nathan Stewart, and Gary Wilson as well as Brandon Lester as Bucky himself, who is the Bucky that we see in this projection. In this clip, he isn't yet a starling, he is just wearing the suit and he just uses it to kill the other employees in order for them to be used as starlings before he himself is turned into one, which is where we come back to this scene here. This is Olivia Finch's last phone call before being killed by Brandon, and coming back into the game, we can fail the minigame one more time, and this time we appear back in the same room, except the roof is open and we're able to jump out and see Olivia's body in the water, with Bucky walking away and once again taking a moment to compliment the game. The sound design of this segment and so many others, which I'll point out as we go on, is absolutely immaculate and gives off this digital terror vibe that I think really fits the horror of the game. 
Sound design in a horror game is extremely important in making the player feel a certain way, and Shipwreck 64 definitely nails it by a long shot. Hey, watch it! But after going through the segment, we see that a new door has been unlocked. Inspecting the sign, next to it we can see what seems to be a bunch of jarbled nonsense, but after waiting a bit... Now, I'm pretty sure that that's meant to be some kind of code or coordinate, but for the life of me, I can't make it out fully. Coming over to Giovanni, we are now able to see that the showing in the theater isn't quite right. And after talking to Giovanni and going into his minigame, there's also a chance for an eyeless version of Olive to appear around the room, and apart from that, all we have to do is just sit and wait for the ovens to burn. As we can also begin to notice other more subtle anomalies occurring, such as the loading screens between levels are becoming slightly longer, and there's just this distinct lack of music in certain areas. Little things that once noticed makes the player feel more unedged, but beforehand you might completely not even, like, realize the thing. And after failing Giovanni's minigame a couple of times, we are once again shown another death of a broadside employee. This time it's the death of Gary Wilson, which includes scenes of Brandon slamming Gary's head into what I'm pretty sure is a microwave and then leaving his body to burn on the stove. You know, just normal co-worker activities, I guess. I'm also going to note the irony of putting the guy who was burnt alive in the mascot suit of a chef character. Kind of fucked up, broadside. After this, we unlock yet another door, which we're not going to be going into yet because we have yet to talk about Walter's new minigame, which puts a whole new meaning into staying the fuck still when a big ass creepy face shows up in the skybox. This was the first really creepy thing that I discovered on my first playthrough, apart from obviously the eyeless olive. So I'll let my reaction speak for me. Am I doing the minigames correctly to see if it does anything different first? And then I'm gonna come back and do them. Ah! Get out! Ew! No! <laughs> I hate that! Ah! <laughs> God is watching! He fucking is! Yeah. I, I don't like creepy faces. Also, while here, if you beat the other minigames in the order that I've shown them in, then Giovanni's ovens will also show up in this level. But after failing Walter's minigame by getting yoinked up by what I'm assuming to be the fucking DreamWorks fishing logo kid, then we get this scene of Brandon leaning over us as we then unlock another door. But after completing the main three, we have the options of going to Stumbler and Chief Wolf's missions. And you'll begin to notice while running around that... The time is now permanently stuck at 1pm, and we can find our possible reasoning for that being by heading over to Chief Wolf's minigame, and looking around we find this TV flashing a code of red, green, and blue. More specifically, blue, red, green, green, which as we'll find in the later layers acquaints to the code 3899, and remember to keep these colour codes in mind as they appear all over the game. But after inputting the code we are taken to a YouTube video because Yes, this game can load stuff up on your browser, and we're shown that it seems to be a regular trip VOD to the studio grounds, which is essentially the broadside version of Disneyland, obviously being recorded in like 720p for max realism.
Coming back to Chief Wolf's game, we can now take note of Horns, who has started speaking in phonetics, leading to the code. Which turns out to be more of just a red herring, as from what I've discovered, I can't put it into anything. However, I might be wrong. Who knows? Continuing to fail at Chief Wolf's minigame results in us finding ourselves in this cave-like area, where Wolf asks us what we're doing here. Hey Bucky. What are you doing here? Answers, isn't it? You want answers? I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but there's nothing for you here. I'd feel bad if you left empty-handed, so I'll give you this little treat. Check it out in someone else's level. I'm busy though, so please leave me be. And then finally, for this segment, if we fail Stumbler's minigame, then we get this short sequence of what appears to be Stumbler having a candlelit dinner with a mannequin. But after this, we've seen a majority of what is there to be seen here. At least, that's what I've been able to find. The 1997 version of the game allows us to slowly peer into this dark business that Broadside has gotten itself involved in, and begins to slowly dip us into the horror that is to come. Obviously, there's a lot more secrets here to be found, but as I said before, I'm not going to be going over all of them just due to the length of the video already. Layer 2 starts whenever we enter one of the three doors that appear after a character disappears. If we choose to translate the jarbled text on the signs near those doors, well, apart from Giovanni's, we can get the messages Layers 2 Room 1 or Layer 2 Room 3, depending on whether or not you're looking at Oliver Walter's doors. But Wolfram, how did you translate that jarbled nonsense? Well, my good viewer, allow me to welcome you to the world of madness that is Layer 2 and beyond. After playing this game, I have a critter file that looks like the equivalent of a madman scribbling on the walls of his cell, and it's all due to fucking beaver scratch. After seeing this code, you might be tempted to put it into one of those basic deciphering programs, but that won't work here for one major reason. Beaver scratch makes no fucking sense. This is due to some of the letters being pushed forward and some of them being pushed back in a seemingly randomized order. And while this may just seem like Squeak's just lazily shuffling everything around, I personally really enjoy the fact that Beaver Scratch is so randomized, because it forces the player to create their own cipher and work everything out themselves. No throwing codes in an automatic decipher where everything must be done by the player itself, and it adds so much more to the ARG experience that Shipwrecked is. Being forced to learn everything yourself and work out these oftentimes really stumping tasks makes it that much more enjoyable when you finally figure it out, and that's the type of gameplay loop that Beaver Scratch embodies. But, depending which path you choose to go down, you have one of three ways of entering the main section of Layer 2. However, generally you can consider Layer 2 being more of a transitional space between Layers 1 and 3, rather than its own major area. The first of the three areas being Olive's Door, aka Layer 1 Door 2. And we see that there is a very big pool theme going down here. And our first major puzzle comes in the form of our first music puzzle, which, might I add, the shift in tone here being fucking insane. What? 
but on the wall we can see writing of the code is ECDC, which when we listen to the recorder close by... We gotta look at some sheet music. This type of puzzle shows it multiple times throughout the game, and it's just a case of counting how many of each note there are in the sequence in order to get the code, which in this case turned out to be 3777. However, without having anywhere to input the code just yet, we can do a bit of exploration and see that we're not the only ones around. Strange. But we then go back to do some more pull parkour before finding the keypad we need to input the code into and get into the main section of layer 2, where we find out all three paths combined together into this one room. But before we talk about that, let's go for our other two paths that we could have taken. Going into Giovanni's door, we find ourselves in this fancy diner looking area, including a big golden statue of Bucky himself and classy piano music to match. We can also find Stumbler's arm here. <laughs> so, so that's neat. And coming through this door in one of the side rooms, we can get into this upper area, which leads us into the museum. And the music here is definitely... interesting. And like before, we find wolves who question us on what we're doing here. And we can find ourselves another color puzzle. Even though this is technically the first color puzzle, but shh, I didn't plan this out right, it's fine. On the walls we can find different paintings which tell us which colours colourate to what numbers, red being 8, blue being 3, and green being 9. We can then use this to unlock the gates off to the side of us by putting in the codes represented by the coloured bunting. It's also at this puzzle where I was in call with some friends and made a joke that because there's only one bunting, that the code would be just all 8s. Only for that to be the correct answer. And after going through the door at the end of the hallway, we can find ourselves in another, longer, darker hallway. This time with a voiceover going on in the background. Studio Grounds was a theme park that was made in honor of Rex. As a kid, he always enjoyed the theme parks. There was a merry-go-round at a local fair he would ride many times over in a day. The idea of Studio Grounds originally came into conception after a park known as Broadway Beach was created. This was the predecessor to Studio Grounds, and while it brought in great success and happy memories to many children and adults around the world, the travel to an island through a cruise ship was enough to turn away many potential visitors. Moving on into the next room, we can find ourselves surrounded by different artworks created by Rex Broadside, and overall this entire section just seems to be like the company's shrine to Rex. It has a speech supposedly said by Rex or is about Rex playing in the background, old art of Rex's including his first ever character Blot, who is also personally my favourite character alongside Horns, but while here we can find a button that causes a gate in that starting red area to unlock. Backtracking it, we're able to come back to that combining area again. And finally, going back to Walter's door, we enter a segment similar to that of his minigame, and we begin to miss that calm tone that the other sections had. This time, this washed out droning ambience covers the area and honestly, gives me a bit of the chills hearing it for the first time. But walking over to the right, we find... Oh, uh, never mind, let's just- Oh my god, is that a body? He's just- he's resting, I'm sure. While here, we can find a note about Obelisk, something that's totally not concerning given the actions of Broadside, right? Right? It's a note about Obelisks. Today, me and Liz were listening to music. Suddenly, the song changed and a long rumbling sound was heard. Three large obelisks began to rise from the water. Golden statues of the three pure souls rested on top. 
Coming through another door, we can enter a dark room, one which we can power back up by pressing this button here. By doing so, a computer comes to life and shows us that we have to travel on a boat from the start of the area and jump through a fake wall in order to proceed. However, before doing so, we can go over to this door next to the boat and find some of Stumbler's paintings lying about. We can also find a recorder nearby which has the name code is RxBC, and begins to lift off some phonetics that we must transcript into a code by counting how many times a word beginning with a certain letter appears, and we end up having a final code of 6224 which we can input into a keypad after following the computer's instructions. By jumping into that separate area, we can find some wolves just hanging out behind these bars. We can then run across to this button which begins this sequence of events. We are shown three obelisks of Stumbler, Chief Wolf, and JD, which all shoot off into the sky as we catch sight of another husk. Travelling over to the obelisk, it is revealed that we are able to jump between the three of them, and after doing so, we find a door leading down to a spiral staircase, one which, once again, plays a very chilling tune. After getting to the bottom, we find ourselves in this golden, futuristic-esque looking place with golden silhouettes of the cast lining the walls, and statues which follow our every move. This whole place just seems oddly ominous, especially compared to the other two areas, but after pressing this button to cause a PC to mysteriously disappear, we can finally make it back to the main part of layer 2, and the audio only gets freakier from here. Pressing all of the buttons in the room, the code 4923 is revealed, allowing us to open this gate and find a sitting wolf who states, Hi. What brings you here? Are you lost? You should get back into place. While here, we can find this PC, which leads us to the official Cogsware website, where we can find a lot of new information, including some new names. Connor Thomas, Elizabeth Baker, and Harry Waters. And so far, only Elizabeth has made an appearance to her having her name be on this art of the free obelisk we just went through. But apart from that, we can just find some information about the history of Cogsware and a description for Shipwrecked. We are Cogsware. Cogsware Games was originally an idea that three friends out of Silicon Valley had one night, founded by Connor Thomas, Elizabeth Baker, and Harry Waters. We are a collective of fans of the new and thriving world of gaming, and we put innovation at the forefront. With our first ever demo of the game Blundercover being a hit with crowds over at local conventions back in 1995, and a thriving partnership with Broadside Animation Company leading to the creation of the magnificent Shipwrecked, we won't hold back on getting our hands dirty with game development. After all, that's where the name comes from. Every cog in a machine has to be working together to create a meaningful result. We here at Cogsware are in it for the players, and for moving forward. We've dabbled very heavily into three-dimensional graphics, working with top-of-the-industry professionals to create worlds with depth, colour, and life. While we make games that are bright and friendly, you're not getting a squeaky clean experience if you play a game from Cogware. Instances of adult humour and some edge to our games are all present. We believe that games should not be designated to a single demographic, but rather shared among many demographics. We don't make kid games, but we also don't make adult games either. Think of us as a fine line in the middle. Let's keep innovation at the forefront. We can make some amazing things together. Shipwrecked is a game developed by us at Cogware, partnered with the Broadside Animation Studio. Bucky and his friends need your help. After a sudden crash during a routine fishing trip, Bucky ends up on a mysterious island, where his friends appear to be apprehended by a pack of wolves for disturbing the peace. Embark on this puzzle-based adventure as Bucky wanders the vast island of Nullaterra, helping his friends work off the damages, fix your boat, and go back home. Made for the new Nintendo 64 console and powered by Unreal, Shipwrecked is a game that puts you into the shoes of Bucky's imaginary friend, as you must help guide him back to his homeland, and maybe meet some friends on the island along the way. With a fun puzzle-based gameplay structure, many endings, and dynamic gameplay, you'll never wind up with the same playthrough twice. This game would not be possible without the wonderful partnership between Ozai Cogware and Broadside Animation, who helped fund the development of this game, as well as providing reference photos and even making a full commercial for our game.
Bucky sends his regards. However, clicking on this thumbnail, we're taken to the trailer and troll for Shipwrecked, with new text reading, A new adventure awaits. Developed for the Nintendo 64, Shipwrecked is a game that places you into the role of Bucky, as you guide him playing small mini-games with his friends as a way to free them from the island. In the midst of scary monsters that roam the forest, or little rabbits that like to dabble in the arts, there's no shortage of fun stuff to do in Shipwrecked, and when it's over, the game has many different endings you can explore as well, many different possibilities to see. For this project, Cogware has been brought on to assist with the development of the game, making models, programming, sounds, music, and even some voiceovers. The game is very much a narrative experience. While maybe not as action-packed as Banjo, Mario, or most other platformers, you will have to really use your brain to move Bucky closer to his happy ending. Designed to take full advantage of the Unreal Engine, Shipwreck demonstrates many features that keep the game running smoothly on consoles, allowing for a fun and freeing experience. We encourage exploring, maybe you'll even find something once in a while that you may not have noticed before. Every playthrough is a new adventure after all. See you on the island. Toodles. And I have two things of note here. The first of which may not be as important, but throughout the whole game I've noticed the use of the word toodles quite a bit. And it might just be me overthinking stuff because I've seen Squeaks use it for other stuff, but I think it's a bit strange that the word is used so much throughout the game. And second of all, it being the A in the word rabbits. The letter A is a link that takes you to this video of what appears to be either Stumbler or Vandal, who is another mascot character I've had yet to mention, walking around the hallway just out of view. And if we scroll down a bit, we get this lovely message. I don't think I've ever met a man as pathetic as you. But apart from that, there isn't much to come across here, and we can come back into the game itself, and finish off this section by traveling down this corridor and reading two notes from Cogware Games, stating... It's a note from Cogware. Whoa there. This room is designated to staff only. Feel free to hit respawn. Connor Cogwire Games. It's a note from Cogwire. If you really want to go down there, well, then feel free. Just be warned. Connor Cogwire Games. But obviously, we ignore these warnings and delve straight into layer three. And just to start off this segment, I want to point out that you know a game is scary as shit when it makes you feel fucking nauseous. Not scared. Not anxious. Fucking nauseous. I don't know, maybe it was like the different amount of energy drinks that I have as a part of my daily whatever, but getting to layer 3 made me feel fucking nauseous. And this wasn't a one-time thing either. On all of the streams I've done on this game past the start of Layer 3, this game has managed to put me through all of the motions of a fucking panic attack. So much so, that from now on, you're getting the fucking VOD recording. Because I am not going back in to record any more of that part of the game that I already had to. At least until we get to the plaza. But coming back to the start of Layer 3, we are hit with a staircase. One which has probably the most fitting ambience track I've heard so far, as we see a wolf run off down the stairs. On the walls we can see writing telling us to stop in a hangman game which spells out Brandon. And while I may seem like I still have my cool in this clip, I had already been shown what was waiting for me in the coming areas. <coughs> the plaza. And if there was one thing I hate more than the unknown, it's knowing exactly what's about to happen next and knowing that it's going to be scary as shit. Yeah, here's what a fucking real shit happens. 
It looks like it says Brandon. I'm pretty sure that just says Brandon. Stop. Weird fucking eyeball bucky. Stop now. I mean, I forget what his name is Stumbler. There's what a fucking real creepy shit happens. Coming through the door at the bottom of the stairs, we are now plunged into the darkness. Bucky explaining to us that none of this makes any sense and that he just wants to go back home before just deciding the best he can really do is just put any responsibility on what happens next on us. None of this is making any sense. I want to go back to the island. I want to go back home. Is that not what you're playing? Look, we can do this, but whatever happens next, that's on you. Am I clear? Good. We can also find a tape labeled Olivia in Beaver Scratch, which contains another person describing Olivia's actions and cries for help before inevitably running out of air and drowning. This other person is most likely Brandon, as he would be the only one with this knowledge, However, he then proceeds to mention the rodent, being the one standing and watching it happen, so it's now unclear to me whether or not this is Brandon or another character describing what happened. It hit her before she even knew it was coming. It started with loud screaming, reduced over time to mere crow. Any will to swim away slowly drained away as she sunk down further into the water, polluting its natural color. The rodent stood a few feet away, watching the effects of his actions, and only began to walk away when she stopped struggling. Next to this, we also find a sign labeled where we lie, and now our only option is to leap of faith into the darkness and dig ourselves further into layer 3. Following a trail of blood, we find ourselves a door, and the ambience only seems to pick up from here. Coming into what seems to be a wooden cabin style room, we find writing all over the wall stating they're lying and look me in the eye and tell me. I don't know what this means, but did it freak me out any less? Th of course not. Coming into the big empty forest room, we can find a computer in the middle, and are introduced to probably the most important website that we'll find. It's a website called The Helping Nub, and it's ran by both Stumbler and Chief Wolf. In this website, we can learn a lot of valuable information, which I'll reveal when it's important. The first of which being a short section about Stumbler and Wolf themselves, that being that Stumbler had always been a big fan of art, however, his reason for his whole lack of arm situation is because he was attacked by a rabid wolf one day, and has been forced to live without arms ever since, and that he'll be the one responsible for any art we find on the site. Moving on to Chief Wolf, we find that Chief Wolf wants nothing more than to help the other wolves on the island, dedicating his entire life to helping the people and keeping them away from harm. He'll be the one responsible for any writing and research we find on the site. Moving on to asking where we actually are, we are explaining the concepts of layers, and what we need to do in order to get out of our current area. Layer 3? Layer 3 is where you are right now. As you may know, the island is split into layers. For instance, Layer 1 is the island, outskirts, and any attached missions. Layer 2 consists of a pool, a diner, and a waterway. And now you're in Layer 3, the land of darkness. That's okay though, if you come properly prepared, you should be equipped to either venture even further, or keep yourself safe. To open the gate and move on to the next zone, locate and charge the computer to free free. Once it's open, find the gate control and turn it on. We are also shown that our candle will remain with us whenever we need it and that it's impossible to lose it. Around the next layer, we'll be able to find computers with valuable information on them, and if we ever see one with a big red button on it, then we should be wise to press it. We're told about beaver scratch as well as the other ciphers that we've found so far. We can also find this little section from Stumbler talking about how he's got an artist burnout and that he wants some help with suggestions which, while writing this script, is actually updated to say how happy he is with all the suggestions he got him. Which is a really nice touch. However, most importantly, what we've got to worry about right now is this section about Layer 4. 
There's a gate at the back half of the plaza. Look for it and you'll find it eventually. Gotta get it unlocked using these two simple tasks. Truth be told, we don't know if there is a layer 4 or just how deep this all goes. For the longest time, it was assumed that it only goes to layer 3. But recent searches have shown some kind of paradise down there. If you can find it, then by all means you'll have my gratitude. I'm proud of you, Bucky. Good luck with your adventures. For task 1, we first need to make it down to the plaza. So that's exactly what we're gonna do now. Going off to the left of the computer, we arrive in another pool-esque location, in which we can find the first, well, technically the third, of a set of split-up videos detailing the events of what happened to the Broadside employees, and explains a bit more about Starlings. Putting them all together, we get this video. This tells us a lot about the backstory of the biological experiments going on here. On the IRL version of Nolaterra, the place where Broadside has its attractions, they found this living, fleshy material and decided to begin experimenting with it. After the death of their free employees, they decided to use this experimentation as a cover-up and to hide that the event ever happened by turning the victims into starlings and using the mascot costumes to melt them into the perfect form. However, as we know, these came out with deformities that Broadside didn't want. Things like extra teeth, metal pipes, and forks developed into starlings and they were deemed rejects. However, even after learning this information, we're yet to find out how this has managed to affect the development of the game. Guess these horrible meat rock experiments were going on in reality, but 
How has that managed to affect the game as to where things were beginning to go all wrong? Well, all will be revealed in due time. Coming back into the game, we can turn the corner and find a tape labeled Devlog Random. These Devlog pigs can be found all around the game and are Connor's tapes that he's recorded himself. This tape in particular, he refers to Harry and how he's been stuck on Olive's minigame, namely due to Giovanni appearing at random and disappearing whenever he got close to him for seemingly no reason. All right. Today is August 12th, 1996. We've been given the go-ahead to get back to work on the project. It's been rocky, but we're all getting back into it. Harry's been at his workstation all day, playing through, well... He's been stuck on all of his level. The coconut one. Apparently, there's been an issue with the chests spawning in. They just appear a random, which is already bad. But then they soon vanish when you get too close. I'm really just not sure. It's very confusing. I'll figure it out soon, though. So. I'm sure of it. And Liz has been busy as always. She's trying to catch up on the game's artwork. We finally got a finalized design for the wolf guy, mostly changing his proportions. So we can share his animations with other characters if we need to. But yeah, she's killing it, as usual. And on my end, not too much. I'm just chipping away on a little debug map right now, calling it just the plaza for now, until we can think of a cooler name for it. But yeah, that's where we're at right now. I'm going to keep recording these. They're very fun, for sure. All right, see ya. Putting in the code 4742 allows us access to this button, which I'm going to be honest, at first, I had no idea what it did. And coming back into the main area, we can jump over into this grate and find another music cipher, this time relating to the song Ode to Joy, with the code being EFG9. This time we do the same thing that we did for the Hot Cross Buns puzzle and get the answer of 9449, allowing us to enter the next area where we find another button that, once again, doesn't do all for now. In this area we can also find a computer displaying Olivia's creepy fucking face. This means nothing to the actual gameplay but I had to see it so now you do too. Exploring a bit more, we find one final button and it turns out that we've just been charging computers this whole time, but the gate's still not open yet. Coming back to the room we found a helpful nub website on, we can go off to the right this time and find another more forest themed area, where we find another color puzzle and some more computers to charge up. This time we can find a door labeled gate control and now we know what it is we're wanting to get to. Running around, we look for some more buttons to press, eventually coming across a video titled Magma. The video itself, however, is a red herring as of right now, and we instead have to look into the description and find the name Mount Pinatubo, which relates to an active volcano which erupted back in 1991, which so far I've also found no use for. We can also find another devlog here, this time labeled Devlog Progress, where we can start to see a boost in Connor's behavior as development seems to be moving well. In-game noise. As in- Okay! Today, the beach, park, and hull are all complete. Yeah, that wasn't anywhere in any of my maps. I was in game. To set up or teleport once we have the mini games completed. Oh, it's March, by the way, '96. Sorry, I'm just kind of excited. Why am I sorry for that? Today's a good day. Um. Anyways, everything is going smoothly. I think Liz needs to get back to me with Walter's mall plus his head texture, but it's smooth sailing. I guess. You I think I've patched the noble bugs too, even the one Harry found in the hole, where you get soft locked behind the bed. How did he even do that? That's... Uh, I'm planning to talk to Mark later. I can't wait to show him the progress. I think it's gonna go great. We'll... we'll have to see, though. That's all. Signing off for tonight. This begins to add more mystery as to what happened during development, as for right now, Connor seems really happy with the way things are moving. They're fixing bugs and they're getting things completed. It's only a matter of time until we figure out when things started to go wrong. However, after finally unlocking the gate control, we're able to open the gate to the plaza. And here's where the true horror of the game began to kick in. Okay, so I didn't think that I'd have to record more audio for this game, well, video, but like, whatever. 
but I completely forgot about a third section that exists, like, here. Because I, I never saw it when I played, but I saw it now whilst recording footage for the game. So, there's a third section that I completely forgot about. If you go completely past the computer, instead of going right or left, you'll find a third door, which instead leads you into this office-looking area, which I completely just didn't know existed. It just kind of looks like a normal kind of office, just with a lot of computers and some writing on the walls, ones which says, is this where you were, and an illustration that looks kind of like Chief Wolf's eyes. <laughs> There's also this writing on the wall that says, live, laugh, love. While here, we basically just do the same things as before, finding more buttons to press. And while here, we can actually come across this. We'll come up- we'll, we're about to see this version of Walter in like a second anyway, so I'll explain him then. But this writing on the TV just says 8291. I'm fluent in Boover. Boover. Boover Scratch? F <laughs> yeah, I've, I've played this game too often. I've become fluent in the fucking cipher language. But bringing this code back to a keypad, we can find our final button as well as an audio tape from, I think it's Mark. It. Uh, uh, that's a lie. It definitely is Mark. He talks about ha Haley. Harley? Harley? Harley. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm gonna be honest, uh, I'm gonna sound like, uh, like a madman recording one of these things, you know, I, 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 I just kind of need to feel like um, I'm talking to someone, even if I'm not, so, yeah, um, <sighs> shit, uh, where to start, uh, you know, this week it hasn't been the greatest, Oh, well, let's say that lightly. No, this, this week has been horrible. Um, everything feels like it's just going off the deep end, and um, I'm just starting to wonder how much I got left. Um, Harley's still in the hospital, and until she's out, I'm sitting in this office. It's it's big. It's cozy, yet it feels so empty. Not a single soul has entered this room in days, aside from, you know, myself. But, um, I, you know what, it, it doesn't matter. Just, uh, just, just remember your affirmations, and you'll be fine. But yeah, he talks about Harley and how she's been stuck in the hospital, and he records this on this audio tape. But pressing the button, it also will open the gate, using any two combinations of any of the rooms will open the gate. But apart from that, the back, back to the fucking audio that I already recorded. Behind this door awaits what I know to be probably the scariest section of a horror game I've seen in recent horror titles. So scary that for the first time in a long time, I've gotten scared just by watching someone else play through the area. It's what originally got me so hyped about playing the game. Taking a small break back to the Helping Nub website, we still have one more section to look at. The Dwellers. The Island Dwellers. Dwellers, also known as Starlings, are creatures who live in the darkness of Layer 3, donning the faces of Bucky's own friends. They will wander around the dark, searching for any unfortunate little beaver who happens to stumble into their path. Awakened when Walter, Giovanni, or Olive are brought down into Layer 3, they will stalk around the dark and eventually make their presence known. You cannot rely on your menu to keep you safe. Look for a barrel and interact with it to hide away. While a dweller may follow you around in Layer 3, it doesn't mean that they won't try to follow you elsewhere. Stay alert. You may not be as safe as you think. If a barrel or any other object appears to be off or moving, repeatedly hit it until it vanishes. When captured by a dweller, you will be taken to a small room, akin to that of a prison cell. Little do they know, however, your little rabbit friend knows the code. If you're trapped, the keypad to exit will be 7418. Remember that. If you wind up there, you will need this to escape. One thing that I've forgotten to mention so far is that the starlings themselves do have an effect on electronic devices. They can kind of infect hardware in a way. Not software, just hardware. And we can see this as in later tapes that are being used on infected hardware, 
voices begin to glitch out and just seem wrong, and this only happens after things started going wrong with the starlings themselves. But somehow, some way, the starlings are in the game, and since we went ahead and failed all of the mini games, they'll all be down here hunting us. Depending on who you fail at the start and whose thing you go down, with in this case being all three, that's how many starlings are going to be chasing after you here. Each of the starlings have their own special ability. Walter can break barrels, Giovanni hears audio tapes, and Olive. Wallers. Yeah, there it is. 7418. Get out of my ear. Get out of my ear. <laughs> yeah, you thought those borders were there for old game aesthetics? Absolutely fucking not. When Olive peers through the borders of the screen, we must be quick to hop into a barrel or else she'll see us and begin chase. The idea that the Starlings have become one with the game and are choosing to break through what they're confined to deal with now is possibly one of the scariest parts of this game. Combine this with the fact that the audio is now directional, so you can tell exactly which side Olive's gonna come from, and you have probably one of my favourite gimmicks I've seen in recent mascot horror. Something you thought was just a part of the game trying to look older than it is, turning out to actually be a vital part of the game's mechanic when you least expect it, is an amazing concept, and it adds so much to the horror that is the Starlings. As well as this, you can find that at all times, well, without breaking their fucking necks to do so, the dwellers will have a constant stare on the camera. They know they're in a game, and they know that you're the one playing. However, this is contradicted by the fact that even though they know where we are, they can't get to Bucky if he hides in a barrel. Being able to both simultaneously break the game and play by its own rules makes the Dwellers an extremely interesting set of antagonists to go against, and we haven't even talked about what happens when they find you. And six, two, one. Hey! Six, one, two, eight. What's up? Do I not put it in this one? It makes sense. Oh, Jesus Christ. Get away! Never do that to me again. <laughs> what do you mean he was just there? What do you mean he was just fucking there? That sudden chase theme combined with the speed and creepy look of the dwellers makes for one of the biggest scares that the game can offer, especially when it's the first time occurring. While playing through this section, I'd find myself hopping from barrel to barrel at the slightest noise of a dweller being nearby. Because, oh can you fucking hear them. <laughs> Bucky, I didn't really bad at incident, but I'm hoping you'll be your hope. Stay out of the world. In general, with the horror genre, patrolling enemies in games freak me out. The idea that something is designed with your slightest mistakes in mind only for them to chase you down at the slightest side of you makes any horror game scary to me. And I feel like with the dwellers especially, it makes the game and the thing patrolling you feel alive. Especially if it's well built. The plaza is what I believe to be the game's strong point, and even without it, the game would still be really good. I feel like the plaza takes the game to this whole other level of horror, making me feel like I said before, fucking nauseous whilst playing through it. But now that we've arrived in the plaza, we have a couple of tasks to complete. Hopping back to the Helping Nub website, we can reread a couple tasks Stumbler and Wolf have left for us. Task 1 is to go and find a video labelled Crystals, as well as finding the part of the plaza which contains said crystals, and look for Stumbler's tape where he informs us of the code 1997 which will be important to us very soon. Next, we go and find a sky-themed hallway, solve another music cipher with the help of the crystal video playing Mary Had a Little Lamb, and get into this room with two large computers. 
But don't press that button just yet because we have some more areas to unlock. See, if we were to press that button now, then it would start a 10 minute timer where we must go around to 20 different golden computers and input that 1997 code. Only problem is, as of right now, we only have access to 16 of them. So instead, we must go over to this section of the map and unlock another red diner section and a computer section, both with different puzzles to accompany them, involving listening to an audio tape about carrots in order to unlock more color codes. By doing this, we unlock our final four computers as well as another tape titled Optimus Free, which I haven't mentioned them yet, but Elizabeth has her own set of tapes. And in this one, we start to see that something has gone horribly wrong with Connor and the development of the game. Let me see this. Optimus Free. Hello, we are not available now. Please leave your name and phone number after the beep. We will return your call. Connor? Hello? Look, you're going to have to answer me soon enough. I, I went in a day because despite the stress of this job, all of the work I'd spent the last year on being put to waste, and all of us being taken off of our payroll, I wanted to check in and see if you were there. But not only do I walk in and see you're gone, but so is half of the equipment. What are you doing? Call me back when you hear this. We really need to talk about this. Connor has disappeared along with all of the equipment that was being used to make the game. And as we'll come to find out in the later tapes, Connor has decided to take the game on himself, without the help of the other Cogware members, without Broadside, all by himself, for reasons that we have yet to find out. But coming back to the plaza, we now have our two sections unlocked, meaning that we're now able to finally access what is to me, the most panic inducing section of this game. Coming back to that room with the two big computers, we are now tasked with memorizing all 20 of those golden computer locations. After pressing the big red button, it begins a 10 minute timer in which you must go around to each location and type in the code 1997. All while being tracked by the starlings and what has to be my favorite track of the entire game begins playing. When I said that I felt fucking nauseous before, <laughs> yeah, that was nothing compared to the stress, anxiety, and nauseous sickness that I felt during this section of the game. The patrolling enemies, the horrific soundtrack, and overall the creepy design of the plaza was now all topped together with a big old time limit. And it freaked me the fuck out. So much so that for the entirety of my second attempt, I couldn't do anything but babble whatever number of computer I was on and pray I didn't run into any dwellers. Six. Seven. Thirteen. Fourteen. Fifteen. Nineteen. Ah! Can we please? Oh my god. 
How did I memorize that? How did I... How did I memorize that? <laughs> oh my god, my heart. If I had a fucking... Wait. Make sure that your fingers in the center of a sensor. Fuck that. My heart's beating fast. That's all you need to know. It's fast. Fast beat. Fast beat go boom boom. Panic. Legit? <laughs> that fucking stressed? Couldn't even fucking do commentary. It was just numbers. I was just babbling numbers. That's, oh, that's fucking Jesus Christ. Forget my video about SCP-939. This section here has the new title for being the scariest thing I've ever fucking played. I was so panicked and scared that after beating this section, I felt as if I just ran a fucking marathon with how fast my heart was beating. So safe to say I was pretty fucking scared. And this is only improved upon because after that, I forgot that there was an entire other task to do. Boy, am I ready. Get me the fuck out of here. No, don't put me No, I don't want to be back here. Please, I don't want to be back here. Ah! <laughs> and it's not even done yet. It's not even done yet. We still have more to go. There's a reason I say we're going bad with this fucking game. I can feel it. I can feel it. It's coming. Fuck out. Save. Hey, why isn't it open? Why is it? What do you mean it's not open? Yeah, we're still not done here. Going back to Helpful Nub for the last time, we can take a look at our second task, which is to go look around for free green batteries and drop them all off at the computer in the basement. While holding a green battery, we're unable to sprint, jump, or drop off of anything. So each time we're bringing these free batteries to the basement, it feels like these agonizingly slow walks where we are far more vulnerable than we ever have been before having to now drop the battery if we're seen by a dweller and book it. But after putting in all the batteries, the gate opens and we're finally able to leave layer 3 and the plaza, getting to the fabled layer 4, where we have no idea what awaits for us next. Coming through the door, we arrive in what seems to be some kind of a development showcase, where we can find various notes around the area from Cogware talking about their new breakthroughs in Unreal Engine. Well, breakthroughs for 1990 standards. We can find examples of character AI, skyboxes, fog, and lighting, all with this washed out tune playing over everything. <laughs> There's a couple of secrets to be found here, and honestly, after coming out of layer 3, it's a very needed break from pure horror. It's not scary like the other parts of the game, however, you can still tell that something isn't quite right here. But making our way through the level, we come across an elevator and a locked gate. This gate will be more important to us once it's open, so for now we'll make our way down the elevator, and find ourselves in a whole new area called the Aquarium. However, we're not the only one here. This is Blot, Rex Broadside's first ever character and what really got him into the world of creativity. Now, I'm not entirely sure, but it's questionable to say that this is actually Rex, mainly due to this sign in the gallery we get for beating the game, and the fact that Blot has a chance to say Romeo Echo X-Ray. <laughs>
Which is of course phonetics for Rex. And also the fact that the entire reason that Broadside started the development into Starlings in the first place was to bring Rex back from the dead. All lines point to Blot being Rex, however, I'm not really sure. Much like Olive, Blot is able to use the borders to look for you and if you don't get into a barrel, he'll spot you and oftentimes catch you. As well as this, a neat little feature that divides Blot from the rest of the dwellers is the fact that you can actually fight back against them. In this little sequence that you saw earlier, you're actually able to bash him back into fucking pixels if you catch him before he gets up. The main thing of note for this section are the numbered rooms, these green and red lights, a keypad next to a lock gate, and this set of codes with a set of X's and O's next to them. Now, the aquarium isn't that spooky of an area, especially after just coming from the, like, the plaza. However, this next section brings us back into the terror. As we're able to enter the sewers, a dimly lit grisly environment similar to the plaza. But if the plaza was a fucking maze. The game gives us a map relatively close to the start of the section, but I'll be fucking honest, I had a better time using my own personal mind map because... God damn it, Stumbler, just show me the whole map at once. I'd say this with a love-hate relationship as I feel like the maze-like environment for the section works in its favour. With our current task down here being, and you'd think I'm crazy, to get caught. And you'd never guess who decided to make an appearance this time. I'm just hearing random violin music, I've never heard that before. Yeah, I've never heard that before. <laughs> Oh, I remember, like, the old, like, Lost episode ones. I want to get out and see what it is. So badly. You know what? We're gonna... Uh, Bucky? Bucky! Bucky is here now. Bucky is a very strange character. He can do a variety of different things, namely the ones I've seen being that he can break barrels and that he opens tabs up in your browser, which happens to be later on, and specifically for me opened up these free tabs, which scared the fucking shit out of me whilst playing. They just- they look freaky as hell. But once inside of the cell we can do a little bit of exploration, we can either choose to exit the jail normally by opening up the gate, or by walking through these fake walls into another section above the jail, where we can get the code 9396 from some coloured barrels and go to the world's most cursed boat ride. I hate this audio. It's... This is like... An abandoned fucking ice cream truck. <laughs> On the other side we can find another devlog and a video titled Times, which shows us a series of locations including invisible buttons which we must now go and find, which adds to that maze-like structure I was talking about before, using our own knowledge of the sewer room structure in order to find these buttons. Also, the times mean absolutely nothing, it's a complete red herring, you can press them in any order at any time. But after finding all of the buttons, which took quite a while for me, purely because I'm a big wuss and wouldn't leave the barrels unless everyone was out of the room, another tab opens with a video of a gate in the sewer's opening. Travelling over there, we can find a small set of two rooms, which gives us a site labelled Code Breaker, which has its own set of codes, another devlove tape, and some codes, however this time there are no X's and O's. At least, I didn't find any and I had to figure it out myself later on and our time in the sewers is now over. We're able to go back up to the aquarium and test out those new codes we found. However, 
We'll find that none of them work for the keypad, and what we must instead do now is go over to the Codebreaker website, download a zip file, unpack it, and find a whole nother game inside. Loading it up, we get a short section where Bucky tells us he wants us to play Shipwreck sometime, before failing to save and walking through this door. We then get a small section of who we can assume to be Brandon in the Bucky suit, walking around. We then enter this room with a bunch of computers and Paul, and coming up to the big computer, we realize the purpose of those X's and O's. For a pattern of four, which we must input into these buttons and put the two codes we found for each into the keypads on the big computer, which opens up this gate and reveals a few sets of videos for us. Genius I am. I don't think I want to be genius. I don't think I want to be a genius. One. How many? This is not room two. This is absolutely not room two. That's the background on the Codebreaker website. That's like grass or some shit, right? That is not grass. That's Olivia. 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 For our first code, we're required to go back to the aquarium in the main version of Shipwrecked and to count the amount of doors, computers, tables, and lights in the room, labeled with a big one, leading to the code 2634. However, this code won't work on the keypad either, as we must also go into room label 2 and look at the many computer screens. Since there's too many computers and tables to count into a four-digit code, we can instead grab the 1995 off of the computer screens. Also, while here, it's really important to note this letter from Cogsware. Okay, so I don't actually have footage of me reading that note, but what you need to know is it just says that there's four people in a room, specifically three men and one woman, which I think relates to the Starlings, because there's Gary, Nathan, Brandon, and Olivia. So, <laughs> that, that's all the fucking note says that's important, really. But this gives us another pair of codes to put into the code breaker with that set of green and red lights being our X's and O's this time. And I'll be honest, when I say this level had me stomped for quite some time again, it's also one of those things that I just love about the game. Going back to a more critiquing view of the game, Shipwrecked has gotten some criticism for being too complex. However, I think this works for it. In a lot of puzzle style horror games, or just puzzles in horror games in general, you tend to see the same couple of puzzles repeated over and over again. And it seems to be just because the developers seem like players shouldn't care about the puzzles and should be able to just get to the scares. Shipwrecked goes against this entirely. Shipwrecked isn't just a horror game, it's trying to tell a story. One which you need to work for in order to see everything. The puzzles in Shipwrecked made me think and made me more inclined to look for the secrets as the payoff for finding new hidden lore or secrets just made me that much happier when everything started to piece itself together. This isn't some brain-dead scare fest that you can blindly walk around in, you really have to dig deep in order to find what you're looking for. And it makes me love the game so much more. It's introduced me to new types of puzzles and ciphers and the whole thing just really made it that much more enjoyable to play. But putting this final set of codes into the code breaker, we get this last sequence. I thought it was a UFO. <laughs> It's plot! Oh my god! Guys, it's plot! He's in a microwave! I 
A frame from Rex's first cartoon, Ladies Blood. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, behind this gate lies who could be the start for bright new tomorrow. I could never bring myself to cut the ribbon on my own. For that, I'll need help from a very special chance. Everyone, put your hands together and make some noise for the one, the only. 1917. Remember 1917? 1917. 1917. Long ago, before many of us were born, a man named Rex was brought into the world. Born into a family that was relatively poor, he always strived to create. It was always his dream to become an artist. But up until the 1940s, his cartoons, both animated pictures and comics, had gone entirely under the radar. It was around then, though, that his first picture, Blot, took off. It was about a rabbit that Rex drew, which then proceeded to leap off the page. Utilizing real photographs of Rex's room, and with Rex himself being a character in the short, a foil to the lap of protagonist, this show ended up selling out immediately as folks were interested in the stunning mix of real life and animation. Rex would produce more films of the same nature, until eventually, he was approached by a company who offered him the deal of a lifetime. Little did he know, this deal led to him selling off his character, as he was so quick to sign on, he didn't read very heavily into what he was signing into. To remedy this, he began to work on a replacement, and that is when Bucky Beaver and his friends were born. The popularity of Bucky not only went on to This section gives us a little bit of backstory on Rex and how he sold off his first character, that being Blunt, to some big company before creating Bucky and the gang. But most importantly, we're given the code 1917, which we can put into that keypad in the aquarium and move on to into the next section, which looks also very similar to other parts of the aquarium, except we're now told a story about what went down at Nella Terra. I can't read that. A note from Cogwire. The mess of four men sat in a room. It writhed and twitched like a dying animal. But it was still very much alive. It craved freedom, liberation, and happiness. This note also references that previous one where it mentions the four men sitting in the room, specifically three men, one woman. And I think that this is specifically referring to the four starlings or something adjacent to the starlings. And then the note continues. Is this a note from Cogwire? It begged, pleaded to leave. It's talking about me, it's talking about me. But it was held in that room for a long time. One day though, when checked up upon, the mass was missing. And then finally, this note from Cogwire. It shambled, pulling itself out of the room. And it was far enough out of the building, it split right in half. The two halves went their separate ways. No. Not from Cogware. Where this tunnel leads, you'll know it well. Just promise me you're gonna stay calm. If you go through it, you can open the gate. The world needs to know. Whatever is waiting for us on the other side of the door, we're told that the world needs to know about it. And after reading up about this strange flesh blob going missing and splitting apart somewhere, it's very easy to start making assumptions on what might show up next. Also, next of a note, we can find a final devlog which talks about the creation of Stumbler and how Connor gave the idea to Elizabeth that he should have no arms because he wanted to take a jab at Mark Mullen's wife who had recently gotten her arms amputated, which kind of puts you into perspective the different company's employees' opinions of each other, but we'll dive into this more later. But for our final section of the game, we go through the door and delve into the true depths of Nulla Terra itself. The tunnel is dark, darker than anything that we've seen so far, and the vibe for this whole last area has its own level of dread. Not fear, not panic, just pure and utter dread. Turning the corner, we finally get to see what the whole game has built us up to. I will never jump. I know I got stuck behind the... Oh!
Nauseous. Fucking nauseous. Nauseous is right past me. When I have to say that seeing a heart made mine stop. Yeah, this area took me completely off guard. This is the heart of Nulla Terra and is the cause for these weird fleshy materials that Broadside had been experimented with to do with starlings. The origins of the heart is unknown, but for whatever reason it exists and it's fucking creepy. And going past the heart and through this final door, we can come back up to the showcase area and travel through that now open gate. Finally beating the game. Demo? <laughs> what do you mean demo? How long's the finished game gonna be? Congratulations, we're happy to see that you're engaging with our work. But we're showing this to you for one reason. As a reward for seeing all of Kokra's capabilities. Everyone I'd like to introduce you all to. An exciting game set to release in 1997. I now present... It's gonna be like, Shipwrecked, the full game. Water. The ocean. Oh, that's kind of cool. That's kind of cool. Yeti, yeah, yeah. Huh? Trees! I ran into a monster earlier today. It was right outside the park, his statue put together using chunks of wooden cloth. It looked bizarre, but then I saw it move. Ew. Ugh! Disgusting. Horrid. Vile. Kick it over. Ugh! Kick it over and burn it. Oh, it's you. I thought I was the only one rotting down here. <laughs> so much is that. So much. They call beyond your understanding. They call out to me. All four of them. I hear their voices skittering around in the inside of my wooden shell. Even down to the pulsating mass weighing beneath it. I need you to find me. It won't be easy to catch. You'll need to prove to me that you want what I have. If you do as I ask, you'll know everything. Every single detail of what happened. Why you are who you are. What do you say, friend? Let's give it a go. <laughs> Meet the husk. In this final segment of the game, we must run around avoiding every single dweller that we've come across so far. He can be anywhere in Layer 1's explorable area except for mini games, and we need to find 10 of him in order to beat the game. And when I say this area was stressful as all hell, I was being implied that if I lost now, I would have to play the game all over again. Which, as it turns out, wasn't the case and you just lose one of your found husks and respawn, so... I spent way too long making sure that nobody was around before moving about, but either way, the fact that just based off of the environmental cues and the way this final showdown is set up, that I thought that the consequences would be me having to play the game all over again, is enough to show how well this game is put together. It feels like the whole time you're at the mercy of the game and it really adds to the fear factor in this final conclusion. But after collecting the last husk, we really do finish the game off this time and the ending isn't one that you'd so expect. <laughs> what do I do now? What do I do now? I got them all. What do I do? Let's take a look at the little mess you've made. Me? I didn't do it! 
Oh, we're back here! Oh, I remember being here before. I don't remember the big fucking computer on it, though. Connor, look, I'm gonna be honest with you. I've been playing this for about two hours now, and I'm not seeing the widespread appeal you've been promising us. It's... Well, to be honest with you, it's clunky. I don't know what I'm doing. The characters who you promised would have depth and life. They are just flat. I thought that's the entire point of a 3D game. What? You oversold it, Connor. That's what I'm trying to say. The company is meant to be forging new frontiers. And to be frank, after what happened at Studio Grounds, I really don't think this is going to be anything. It's not going to be anything in the same tier as our movies, our park, anything. And I really hate to say this, because I know for a fact you and your team put a lot of work into this game, but I just... I just don't know if it's worth continuing to sink money into. Sink money into? Mark, this is our job. You've had us working on this for two years, and now suddenly it's an issue? Yes, it's been two years. And in those two years, you've only sat me down now and showed me the actual fucking game. So, what can we do to fix it? No, Liz. This isn't a fix-the-game issue. It's a fix-your-perspective issue, Mark. You are sitting in front of some of the greatest technology of the decade, and you're gonna brush it off? Connor, I'm not brushing anything off. I'm just trying to understand where this- I'm sorry to say, Mark, but it's true. It's not that we've made a bad game. We've all exceeded the industry standard. What we're having a hard time passing is your thick skull and- Connor! Stop. Look, I'm so sorry about him. He's just under a lot of- Is it Harley? Is it not worth it anymore because you're trying to treat her instead? What? Yeah. I said it. What are you bringing her into this for? Because I bet that's what you're gonna do. You can't keep funding our two years worth of work. Gotta buy her a fancy casket. <laughs> Unbelievable. Mark, look, I, I'm really sorry. Now, Liz, you're fine, okay? But I want you to know that we are done, professionally. All right? I don't want to work with any of you guys again. Quite frankly, I don't want to see you guys touch our property. Any of that. Am I clear? Yeah. Yes, Mark. You can go now. No! No! Because first of all, I want our equipment back. You can go now! You can go! Leave! Take a step closer. Lay a fucking hand on me. You lay one hand on me, I'm gonna make sure you stay in jail for a real long fucking time. Huh? Who are they gonna believe? You? You are nothing. I will be taking my leave now. Good luck in your future endeavors. I expect the office to be cleared by next week. Do not contact me again. We take control of Bucky one last time as he states how much of a lovely day it is outside and that he wants some fresh air. Coming out to the balcony, there's only one more thing left to do. Thank you, Mark. <laughs> Don't put a Mori. Whoa! The borders! The borders are gone! Uh. More of like, who is that? Who is that and what is that? It looks like Stumbler, but it's not Stumbler. Or JD. It looks blue. Costume head? Yeah. Yeah, Connor. Yeah, Connor. Probably Bucky's. Yeah, Connor jumps. As soon as the media find the disturbing content, ship characters removed from stores. And for nearly two decades, has been missing. You are among the first to see what's inside of it. In 
not nerfed Con Connor Thomas. It was there for us as a dad, as a boss. I would not be anywhere without you today. And I've missed you and I've stopped missing you since the day- I never stopped missing you since the day we lost you. We hope that bringing your work back is a good way to pay tribute. We miss you, Connor. Yeah, Patrick. Yeah, because I remember, like, in the original lore, Thomas- not Thomas, fucking Connor takes all of, like, the bad shit from Broadside and then passes it on to his son. What was up with Stumbler? He's just- he's a silly guy. Thank you for playing. Oh my- it's the end! Yay! Oh my god. So what was all of that? Throughout the entirety of Shipwreck 64, as well as some of Squeaks' other's work, specifically in the universe of Broadside, we can pinpoint a lot of events that went down here. Starting off with Rex Broadside being born into a significantly poor family. With his love for creativity, he decides to make a living out of it and ends up taking off with his first character, Blot. After the success of his animations, he's approached by a big company and ends up accidentally selling away Blot and is forced to come up with some new characters, those being Bucky and the gang. From this point on, he continues to build up his animation business, Broadside Productions, eventually being among the likes of Disney. Broadside, however, doesn't want to just be among Disney, they want to surpass them. So after Mark Mullins joins the company sometime before Rex's passing in the late 1960s, Broadside Beach is opened up and is pretty successful for some years, as the company continues to grow and grow. That is until the murders of Olivia Finch, Gary Wilson, and Nathan Stewart occur, and sometime around this, Broadside begins investigating the weird material that they'd found inside of Nulla Terra, and begins their experimentations with starlings using it as a cover-up for their dead employees by bringing them back to life as starlings even having Brandon Lester, the committant of those murders, becoming one too. And not long afterwards, Broadside Beach closes down, only to be replaced by the studio grounds. And here is where Broadside began implementing these starlings as an attempt to rival Disney. Then, Broadside begins a deal with the company Cogsware to develop the game Shipwreck 64. Cogware had only previously developed Blundercover before this. Cogware and its three employees, Elizabeth, Harry, and Connor, put their entire lives into this game for about two years. Everything seems to be going smooth sailing. This is until Mark begins to worry about costs and how Broadside had begun declining in stocks due to all their past negative events coming back for them. We can also see that during this time, especially with Connor, his opinions on Mark begin to dwindle throughout development. Especially when we look back at him talking about the development of Stumbler and him taking a jab at Mark's wife, who had her arms amputated and is, for whatever reason, terminally ill or just generally required to be stuck staying at treatment in the hospital, for what seems to be an indefinite time. Because of this current situation, Mark decides to get rid of Cogsware and stops development for Shipwreck 64. Connor then takes it upon himself to get back at Broadside by taking with him all of the devices and technology used for the game as well as any other kind of little secret or little slip-up that Broadside had, and continues developing Shipwrecked on his own. We find out that Elizabeth, bless her amazing soul, begins calling Connor, worried about him and what he's doing with all the stuff. Eventually, after an unknown amount of development, Connor passes all of Shipwrecked and its components to his son, Pat, before taking his own life. All Pat had to do was make sure that the public saw what had happened and, for Shipwrecked, which Connor had purposely made as outrageous as possible, to be the thing that took Broadside down, and for him to get his revenge back at Mark. Then, as we are told, Shipwrecked is took off the shelves after being soft launched for about three days and is then forgotten about until sometime in 2022, where an in-game Squeaks the Corrugade decides to make an emulator for the game after getting the cartridge off of some random seller on eBay. And then with the help of some others, namely Elizabeth, bless her amazing fucking soul, continuously carrying Cogsware nearly 25 years later, and then obviously the game is released to the public once more, and that's where the game starts. And now, exclusive audio of Wolfram babbling for like eight minutes about a game she likes. And just for my final opinions on this game, this game has to be the best like, mascot horror, ARG, like, just generally any horror game in recent years, this game has beaten it for me. From the visuals, to the audio, to the story, this entire game has just blown my mind. 
even with what I've talked about today, there's still so much that it needs to still be found and hasn't been solved, at least by me. Like, even just after playing for the game and while making these scripts, I found so much more stuff about the game that I didn't know was originally in it. I won't be showing too many of them off now, because the video is already as long as it is, and personally there's so much that I just I haven't found that I don't want to make a full list of them and then end up missing a couple of them. There are a lot of playthroughs of this game that show off a lot of the secrets that I missed and I heavily suggest you go and watch some of those. Just, just go like get more content of this game. I've said it a couple of times throughout the video but Squeaks and like Lillian and everyone who worked on this fucking game did such a good job, even down to the voice actors. All of the voice acting in this game is just peak. That's that's the best way that I can put it. Every single little aspect about this game has made me enjoy it even more. And I'll definitely be playing it more in my off time just to go and find these secrets that I missed, but this game was such a joy to play. Just coming into the puzzles, the puzzles made me actually think instead of them being just the same basic puzzles that you do in every other horror game. Some, like, half of these ciphers and puzzles I didn't even know about until I played this game. And while some people might criticize it for being too complex, I think it adds to the game. It gives the game this charm of having to work for, like, beating the game and the lore and getting the story. You have to work for it instead of just walking around getting spooked left and right, you know? And even when you are getting spooked, the scares are so good that when I say I feel fucking nauseous playing this game, I would wake up in the morning knowing I'd have to stream the game later on in the day, and it would make me feel nauseous just thinking about it. That is how much this game scared me whilst playing it. And I'm pretty sure even now if I were to go back and try to do the plaza again, that feeling would still remain with me. The replayability of this game is absolutely insane and I once again heavily suggest that if you ha if you if you like this video and you like the idea of the game go and play it just go and buy it and play it it supports some amazing people and it's just it's a good thing to play it is it's so good even if you know all of the puzzles and you know what to do you still have all of the scare factor that comes from the dwellers I mean, just look at them. That's some scary ass fucking design. Even down to just little nitpicky things, like the different ways that the characters can fuck with you. Like you have Olive and her border stuff. The Walter being able to break barrels. Bucky opens up tabs in your browser. And Blot is just scary as shit. The designs of these characters feel like they have so much life into them. And they just... Even for them just being spooky scary things that chase you, they feel so diverse in the ways that you're meant to deal with them. Even just down to their animations. Looking at these animations specifically for the borders and when they spot you and just all the data mushing that goes into their jump scare screens. I love the whole thing and this is just me being a fucking nerd at this point. I would analyze every single little bit of this game every single frame of these animations just because they look so good to me. Even just to like, the fact that I was, <laughs> was shown a fucking post not long ago talking about one of the origins of the audio bites, this one. This is obviously when Blot spots you. But fun fact about this audio is that scream you hear in the background comes from fucking Coraline. The other mother scream from Coraline. That is how in depth this game goes with what it grabs from what. There's so much origins to all of the audios and origins to fucking everything and it's it's so cool. I love this game. And I also once again just want to bring up the fact that that fucking the 10 minute timer segment. Be I made that video about SCP-939 not that long ago and I thought that it would stand that fucking title of being the scariest thing I've ever played through for quite a long while. Well, like, quick recap for those that didn't watch that fucking video. That game, that section of SCP Lab Rap made me so scared 
But I stopped moving. I stopped moving, I couldn't fucking breathe. Somehow... Time limit in a sp in spooky in fucking shipwreck 64 time limit computer segment fucked me up even harder than that. That is some fucking talent to say the least. And I'm I'm not fucking stopping this rant now. We're gonna keep going. The audio design just uh, everything feels so grungy and <laughs> that's like I, I I can't put it into words. It's just I love the audio design of this game so much. Like, just, they sound so fucking creepy. I, I can't get over that. Like, just the dwellers on their own have their own individual audios that kind of represent them. And I love it. And they all sound really fucking spooky. But d adding that in with the fucking environmental audio design? D it fucking doubles it. D fucking 10 out of 10 audio design, my god. The fucking drastic changes that the vibe in the fucking audio gives this game. It has, like I said before, it has a very, like, electronical, like, technological terror to it. Just listening to the audio alone, you know that something is not right with this game, especially when you start getting to things like Layer 2. The moment Layer 2's audio hits, the game just quickly, like, evolves in its fear factor from that point on. And I just want to say that I like this game. I love this game. This is probably going to be my favorite game for a long time. Like, Silent Hill. Silent Hill has been my favorite game for a fucking long fucking time. I love the, like, I'm going to talk about Silent Hill one day on this channel. But the fucking, the designs of the monsters in Silent Hill I love. And that's what makes me love the game so much. Shipwrecked has somehow managed to surpass my love for that franchise. And anyone who knows me can say that I am fucking obsessed with Silent Hill. So the fact that Shipwrecked of all games managed to beat that, it is incredible. Go support the people that made this game. Go buy the game. Go play it. Just get- consume all of the content that you can from this game. Because this has to be my, like, my new favorite game that I've seen in recent years. Everything is so high quality and I just- I loved making this video about this game and learning so much about it. Like, there is a reason that this video took two weeks to make instead of just the regular one. And just to end this section of me babbling on, just to end it off, I want to thank the people that made this fucking game because it's, it's just so fucking good. It's it's so good. That's it. It's good. It's a good fucking game. It's a, it's a good game. Good game. I love this game. Even with the original game, I love the concept, and with this newly revamped version, it takes the whole thing ten times better. If there's anything about the game that you want to talk about, make sure to let me know in the comments, because I would love to discuss this game even more. With the amount of replayability this game has, I'll definitely be playing it more in my off times, and try to find anything else that I missed, because believe me, there is so much more. And if you want to go look for yourself, I once again heavily suggest you play it for yourself. Even with knowing all the puzzles, there's so much stuff that I haven't shown. It's showing support for an extremely talented group of people, and so far every interaction that I've had with the developers have been amazing. They're great people and they deserve all the love they can get, but... Apart from that, that'll be all for today, and I'll see you again next week. I'm gonna go take a fucking nap. Bye bye Small reminder for the people that stuck to the end, thank you so much. You only have 28 days. There's only 28 more days until my birthday. You better get us to 5k. Also, on the week that I do announce the little thing, there will be a code for you guys. For you guys that stick to the end of the video, make sure to stick to the end of that video. There'll be a code for you guys.